Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to this month's uh, CMTA webinar, Brace Yourself, Orthotics Q&A. And uh, with me tonight is David Meisner, who um, I know because A, he is my orthotist, and B, he's a um, person who gives a lot of time to the CMTA and to everyone who, uh, who uh, knows him uh, can agree that uh, his expertise here this evening will be uh, time well spent for everybody uh, listening in. Uh, David is originally from Ontario, and um, so we, he's our Canadian friend. For those of us down here in the heat of New Jersey, or wherever you are in the U.S., or wherever you are in the world, uh, David is from upstate New York, and hopefully gets a little cooler weather, though he did say it was a little hot up there today, too. So uh, we'd like to give David an opportunity this evening to uh, speak for a short time, and then we have a number of questions that have already been uh, given to us in advance. And uh, feel free to give us questions as we go through the presentation. Um, David's kind enough to allow me to interject where uh, we need to so we can keep the conversation going, make it a little more fluid throughout the presentation. Um, and then um, at the end, we'll try and leave uh, a period of time for questions uh, before we finish up at around 9 o'clock this evening. Having said all that, I just want to call your attention to a couple things in the uh, control panel that you have open for um, the GoToWebinar. You'll see there's a questions panel in there. Feel free to reach out with questions during the presentation. And uh, like I said, we'll do our best to answer those as we go along. And if you have any um, need for any technical help or anything, I'll try and monitor the little chat window down the bottom there too so that I can help out with any uh, problems you're having, maybe with audio or whatever. Um, so having said that, I'm going to turn the presentation over to David. Uh, David, if you could share your screen now, that'd be great, and we can uh, we can get started with uh, the presentation. And uh, okay. it's all yours. All right. Thank you very much, Bob. So uh, how does my screen look there? Did I press the button correctly? Yep. Looks great. Fantastic. Okay. Well, I hope uh, I hope everyone is uh, ready to learn tonight, and I'm certainly excited to be here once again. Um, some of you may have seen portions of this presentation from um, maybe a portion is from last year and from other presentations that have been around the country. I think it's helpful just to go over things uh, time and time again because it, there is a lot of information here and uh, you know we all forget and we all can learn more and more even when we see the same uh, information presented. Uh, so that uh, right here is a picture of myself and Ethan. And you can see we're both wearing our own distinct braces here. Um, so I do have CMT1B, and uh, I happen to be, uh, fortunately, an advisory board member of the CMT Association, which is just an amazing team. And uh, uh, Bob did mention that I'm in upstate New York, and specifically our main site is in Albany, New York. So um, it's not quite as cool here as where I'm originally from, which is just outside of Toronto. So we'll progress here. So part of the agenda and what I'd like to achieve tonight is sort of just address a lot of the concerns and complaints that I hear from people. Um, typically, many of us will report a lot of these same concerns. And I like to try to just sort of get them out there as far as uh, getting all on the same page here. And with those complaints and then combining it with bracing and such, I like to explain sort of what is really happening to the body and you know, why bracing does help us so much. You know, we don't yet have a cure for CMT and hopefully we will in the near future, but you know, what we have now to help ourselves is certainly exercise, bracing, and eating right and being healthy. And as Bob mentioned, uh, towards the end or at any point throughout, I am more than happy to, to stop and answer some questions and uh, just try to get this to be a little bit more unique for tonight's presentation. So to dive right in, uh, just talking about the patient complaints, and very common is foot drop. But other aspects to that, which uh, a lot of people are aware of, is uh, foot slap. So when we're walking, when that heel first touches the ground, we don't have quite enough strength to hold that foot from making a slapping sound. And then another very important part of gait is when we are pushing off. So pushing off is propelling ourselves forward. 
so these three points of gait are um, going to be directly addressed with, with the bracing that we, we select for you. Uh, poor balance, that's an issue for many individuals. And we typically will use like a, um, a desk or a chair or a friend or a spouse um, or a cane. And then, you know, certainly can use walkers and whatever else is needed to allow ourselves to do the stuff we would like to do. A decreased proprioception. So that's fairly significant. We have nerves that tell us where we are in space. So part of the reasons why we might be so unsteady is our, we're not being told from our feet or from the ground where is our body in space. And if you don't get that information, then you end up using your eyes to get a real sense for where you are in space. So um, in a normal body, that information just travels back and forth so quickly and you make these tiny little adjustments when and no one else notices. But for us, we end up having to make these large steps, large side steps, forward, backward, sideways, because uh, we almost have to get ourselves more upright. Um, ankle sprains, chronic ankle sprains, typically an issue because, again, um, you know, we're just uh, losing our muscles and we just don't have enough strength or the knowledge, like the proprioception, to know that your body's starting to twist its ankle. So make some corrective action from the body. Um, so that's why sprains can happen so much more um, readily for us. The numbness in the hands and feet. Again, the uh, CMT affects the motor nerves, but also the sensory nerves. And these, uh, um, this is significant for when we're ever wearing braces because we don't really know immediately how something feels, and it can take some time. Hand muscles. Uh, it's fairly significant to sort of review um, the strength that someone would have in their hands to see what we need to do for strapping. Uh, sometimes Velcro is so intensely strong it's hard to loosen it. Sometimes we put little loops at the end just to help. Um, so it's important to look at the hands and see what uh, additional measures we need to do to putting braces on, um, whether it's braces on your hands or whether it's braces on your legs. Atrophy, typically a complaint. So atrophy is just the muscles getting smaller over time because the muscles are not being fed, you know, almost like their energy to uh, um, to maintain their 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 healthy state. Uh, atrophy occurs over time. And then with atrophy, we'll see clawed toes. And that's simply because the muscles on either side of the joint, are, um, certain muscles are getting more weak than the other muscles. So you get a, a drawing of the joint in the direction of, um, or away from the weakness. Callousing. We can all uh, um, talk about callousing. It's very typical on the, the base and the head of the fifth metatarsal and also on the first metatarsal head. So the, the first metatarsal head is the ball of your foot, the big toe, and the fifth being the little toe. The pathophysiology of CMT. So the big word just sort of describing why do our feet typically go in this kind of orientation. Not everybody has a high arched foot. Some people are the opposite. But more often than not, you're going to see uh, someone having a higher arched foot. Um, and the reason why is because of the sequence of muscle loss. The nerves are affected furthest away from the body. And so there are certain muscles that are furthest away from your body. And as those start to weaken, it's the stronger muscles that start torquing the body into a particular shape and pattern. So uh, very typically, um, the most common issue for us is the plantar flexed first ray. So, um, Bob, can you see my cursor moving around? Just curious here. So my cursor is moving around uh, the right foot here. And you can see right here, this is the first ray. And typically what happens is the muscles get tight and this ray starts pulling down and it starts twisting the foot. The way you can see in this foot, you can see this angle is um, torqued outward much more than the other side. And that's sometimes things are affected a little bit 
more aggressively on one side than others. So we talk always about the high arch foot and also we can get a forefoot adducted. So that means that this forefoot is moving inwards, which is just part of having a high arch foot. And the inverted rear foot, this cursor working again, but you can see that this rear foot is peeking through right here and that's just getting all the weight line to the outside of the foot, uh, which is not where it normally would be. And then along with this is the whole lower extremity starts to rotate outwards. And uh, this is sort of um, just part of this whole pathomechanics that we try to control with the bracing. So this is a nice diagram that I like to look at. So, you, you know, I know that this is going to be recorded and I'm not going to go through all the details up above, but uh, since it's recorded, people can always go in and really read some of the details. But the significance here is in the central picture, is looking at this plantar flex first ray. That muscle is so strong that it pulls this whole first ray, the ball of your foot down. And, um, you know, if you notice the central line here, this is in a normal foot, all right? So the heel is directly in line with the lower leg. So this is the way a typical CMT foot looks. So someone's not going to just stand up on the ball of your foot. You're actually going to get your whole foot on the ground. So this portion here is going to come down to the ground. And what you're going to get is the forefoot on the ground, but now the heel is tilting off to the side. So that essentially, with, the, with this happening, is getting the weight line all going out much further than we'd like to see it. So the path of pressure. Uh, this diagram sort of shows what is normal. So at heel strike, we land, we all land on the outside of our heel, on the lateral side of the heel. And the normal gait, you land on the outside of the heel, and then your foot comes flat, and then you move the weight line all the way over to the ball of the foot. And then you push off with the ball of your foot, with that whole first ray. And that's what we see in normal human locomotion. Um, what's significant with this is the, the center of gravity, that's the COG there, the center of gravity, it's traveling through a two-inch square. If you imagine a square on your pelvis, you should go up and down two inches, side to side two inches, and that's normal human locomotion. Typically with CMT, that box might be four inches wide, six inches wide, and only two inches up. But the more efficient we can get ourselves, the more we're going to be able to do throughout the day. So that's what we're also looking to do with any kind of bracing. So if you spend a lot of time along the outside of your foot, you're naturally going to get a lot of callusing. And you can see these are, these are pretty standard looking foot. So this is the base of the fifth metatarsal. If you're spending a lot of time along the outside of your foot, because that's where all the forces are going, these are not areas that are really designed for strong, solid weight bearing. So the body responds to try to protect itself by creating these calluses. And uh, it's quite painful and can be quite an irritant. So we like to see a foot that's shaped like this without any callusing. And you know, a lot of times we can achieve that. Most of the time we can achieve that. If we can just redistribute the weight, get the forces occurring on the body in a, in a, in a much straighter alignment, then the whole body weight goes through the foot in a much stronger and straighter alignment. Hey, David, um, I have a yes. question here. Um, going back to that slide, I, I noticed that there seems to be like a bony growth on the side of that foot uh, coming yes. out there. And uh, I have a question here that says, uh, I have a bony growth on the top of uh, the right foot above the arch. Um, is there a way to avoid you know, using bracing to avoid aggravating an area on the top of the foot? Yeah, so that, that bone is very likely the, um, at the head of the talus. So it's just, it's probably, it's very likely not a growth. It just very likely is your bone that is out of alignment. And um, 
And that's actually, um, you know, you call this a growth, but typically what happens is the muscles that were once here, the perineal muscles that were once here, almost hide this bony landmark. And then this bony landmark becomes much more prevalent because this forefoot is torquing this way. So it almost starts to show a lot more. Um, but uh, yeah, those, those can be irritants. Um, so if it's on the top of the foot, um, if I'm imagining it to be where, it, um, if it is what I'm thinking that it is, then you know, within a brace it needs to be accommodated. Now, if it's not at, even at a point of where a brace is, and it's like where the tongue of your shoe is, and sometimes you do have to make some shoe choices that are, are going to pad the area a little bit better. Um, maybe even if you are wearing braces and there is a bony point there, maybe a, a pad over top of it that can be at least more comfortable inside the shoe. Does that sort of help with some of that? Yeah, good understanding, Bob? Yeah, I think that was great. Thank you very much. Okay, so let's see, yeah, you know what, here's a good picture right here. So there's my arrow, so that's probably that bony point that you're just talking about right there. So, um, you know, the, the head of the talus right there is just sort of poking out. And uh, yeah, that can be a problem. So this foot is just torqued so much. You can see how much is along the lateral aspect of the foot. And then really the weight-bearing line is just, so far out of where we'd like to see it that our bracing goals is to try to get this much more in line. Um, so you can see all of these, how it's so torqued on the inside. So you can, I just look at this and just want to push here and push here. And uh, you'll see some pictures of bracing later where we do achieve that and how we do it with strapping. So, you know, this is an excellent area to put a strap straight across here. But if you've got a bony point sticking right out there, then you really do have to create a little bit of a pocket for that bone. Um, so you're not putting extreme pressure right on that one area, and you're distributing it over a larger area. And that's what's fun about what we do as orthotists, is everybody is so different that you do just have to you know, do different things. Even if it's a prefabricated AFO, that, uh, like Allard systems, you know, Never does an average system go on an individual without customizing it for that person. So that's what your architect needs to be doing, is customizing really everything. So you can see the progressions here. You know, if someone is in this kind of position, um, you know, that's, that's just a, not a, a good long-term position. And without it being corrected through bracing or through inserts, you know, very likely over time, it will end up like this. And so these bones sort of just get out of alignment, the ligaments stretch out. And, uh, you know, this, you know, this patient remarkably can become so much more neutral with straps and with the device onto the leg, onto the leg, and, and becomes just so much more efficient walking, so much more stable walking. So goals, I've already talked about this a little bit. Um, so what are the goals of bracing? So it's to prevent deformity, to support and align all the, uh, the skeletal or skeletal structures. Um, we want to limit or enhance motion about specific joints. So if the joint's out of alignment, the, be the best we can do is to get it closer to alignment to make all the muscles more efficient. And uh, of course, balance. So what design is right? You know, it, that is always such a hard question to answer. Um, and, you know, what I, what I like to think about is that, uh, you know, there are some core concepts that we want people to get and, uh, you know, we want orthotists to have. Um, but part of this always has to go with you. You know, you, the patient, you have to be um, tolerant of wearing a particular device. You know, I can build you the best possible, straightest device that uh, you could ever imagine. And if it ends up in your closet, you don't want to wear it, or you can't wear the shoes that you want to wear, then, uh, you know, then that device just isn't working for you. You know, I know that uh, I think a really solid key to all of this is, you know, vanity is, it's reality. 
Um, you know, I succumbed to it myself, and you know, I think most people with CMT, uh, you know, feel we're all so normal, and we are normal. Um, but uh, and we don't want to be wearing braces. And what what typically happens is these deformities just slowly creep in. This is such a for most people, it's a very slow, progressive condition, and these deformities just start insidiously creeping in further and further. And uh, you know, I would just love to sort of catch so many of these problems early, so it's not as difficult to brace throughout the life. And so that's what a lot of these devices can, in fact, do. And and we'll work through what some of the devices are. And uh, I think a really neat thing to conceptualize is that uh, you know I like to think of a device as like a tool. You know I'm I am a hobbyist. I do I work on braces during the day, and I'm in the shop at my home at night. You know, and uh, you know if I'm not going to use a wrench, the hammer and a nail, although I've done it many times, it's just going to be so much more effective using a hammer. And uh, you know. If you think of a device as a tool, it's something that you're in charge of, and it's something that you want to wear, and it's doing what you want it to do. So in some cases, you might direct your orthotist on what you are wanting something to do. But also, in some instances, you may not be able to just have one device. And um, these are expensive, and uh, it's, it's not something that I think most people can have multiple devices on. But it is at least something that I think is a concept that you might just have to balance out um, what can I achieve most of my goals with on one type of device or what can I achieve with another type of device. And you know, if I'm lucky enough to be able to have two, then great. But if not, which one do I select? And hopefully I can give you some of the tools to sort of think about, well, why are certain things so important rather than others? There's a number of different questions here about, um, obviously, about which ones to choose, whether you get the rigid ones or, you know, one of the more flexible type. Um, what are the questions people always, you know, I've always heard, and uh, we have it here on kind of site tonight, is people are worried about muscle atrophy with uh, wearing the braces, and I was just yeah. wondering if you could address that, and if either any style of brace in particular is better than another to avoid that. Yeah, but I I think the key that I want to impress on everybody is to side to side to have good alignment. So that is really important. You can achieve that good alignment with really not even affecting many of the muscles. You know, um, I'm going to flip back a few slides here. So this, this is Ethan, my son. So um, I built him a hinge brace that you saw on that very first slide. That hinge brace does nothing up and down for the main muscles of the body. What, all it, what it does do is it torques him side to side. So, you know, he's got these muscle imbalances, but his muscles are so still strong that he doesn't have a drop foot. He can get up on his tippy toes. He is strong, but it's but it is that there's the imbalance that is creating this problem. So um, I use a hinge brace on him to torque him side to side. I think that is critical. Someone needs to have their heel underneath their body and being as straight as possible. Um, you know, I'm an advocate of under bracing uh, because I do want the muscles to be always used. I'm not a fan of rigid, solid bracing because I think that that can influence muscles long term. You want to be able to use your muscles. You know, I think we all should work our bodies throughout the day. And for us, sometimes just walking is a healthy workout. And that's why we like these dynamic carbon braces. They're lightweight, but they move. So they allow your body to move an awful lot. Um, this is a silicone brace that I was wearing on the front. Um, it, it really does address drop foot, but it's not really good at propelling yourself forward. You have to use your own muscles to do so. Whenever I use any of these silicone AFOs, I always have a foot orthosis underneath it. 
and that foot orthosis is going to support the outside of the foot. It's going to torque things straight. So I do like um, muscles to work. I think that if you're in dynamic bracing, like these are all dynamic, that uh, I'm not going to be worried about your muscles weakening. If you're in a solid, rigid piece, yeah, I think that you can weaken with time. And if you need to have that solid, rigid piece to be able to do your work throughout the day, then wear the solid piece throughout the day or a few hours throughout the day and then take it off. And maybe that's where it's a device is like a tool. Maybe go back to a, a device that's not quite as supportive um, to work your muscles. You know, it doesn't have to be an all or nothing situation. So, um, you know, this is a device, um, drawing a blank on what this is called right now, TurboMed. Um, you know, this is, this is appropriate for someone who still could get up on their tippy toes um, because they still have strong plantar flexors. Um, so that's the, to propel you forward. But this, what this helps with is to lift the foot up during dorsiflexion, um, during swing phase. So this device is, again, very flexible and allows the joints to move throughout locomotion. All right, so uh, we've talked enough about balance. That's why I just scooted past that. Let me go back to that on the slide. Um, so actually, yeah, I tipped it back, but this again is Ethan. So you saw those um, ankles that were twisted inwards. Well, these are the braces that we were wearing, Glenn. So you can really get a sense how things are straight. And so this strap here, what's really significant and subtle about this, but it is powerfully significant, is it's connected on the inside of this plastic. So this strap has a tendency to pull the body this way towards this wall. And then there's a second strap down here that's hidden by the shoes that's going across the dorsum of the top of his foot. It's below his ankle. So I've got one strap below his ankle, one strap above his ankle. And that's torquing him and pulling him this way. Prevention is the key. You know, I think anyone who has any kind of callusing or any kind of high arch foot, you need to be wearing foot orthoses. Um, and that is where we want to support the outside of the foot. You know, you, you have an awful lot of arch support, so you don't need really any arch support. But what you do need is the foot orthoses to try to push that arch down by supporting the outside of the um, the foot. SMOs, supramalleolar orthosis. So that's just a little bit taller. I've got some pictures of it later on. Um, An SMO is just getting a little bit more control of the foot. So the higher you go, the more force the brace can put on your body. And, uh, you know, we pretty well select the height based on how much torque and force do we need to put on the body. The higher you go, the further you, away you get from the joint, and the less this plastic is actually hurting the body here because it's further away from the point of rotation. So it would basically disperse forces over a larger area. And that's precisely why I have two straps. Two straps can do more than just one strap. I talk about forefoot posting. So I want to post the, the front of your foot to accommodate that, that ball of your foot that's hanging down. So if, if that's a rigid deformity, if it won't get out of the way, then you have to put material there to bring the ground up to the foot. You don't want the foot to fall down to the ground. Stretching. This is really key. Um, all of us, if we have a dropped foot, uh, your foot, your muscles along the front of your leg do not have enough strength to lift your foot up. So over time, these weaken so much and you always have the strength of your calf muscles pointing your foot down. And then when you sleep at night, uh, lift feet are pointing down, we're spending more and more time without our foot dorsiflexed, so fully lifted up. What can happen over time is, is the Achilles tendon can become quite tight. So all of us should be on exercise programs to be stretching out your Achilles tendon and your hamstrings. Um, you know, I'm guilty for not doing it, but uh, you know, the only person I'm hurting is myself, so uh, you, you definitely need to be on yourself to do this stuff. So here's the so orthotic. Yep. Uh, David, I just because um, there's a couple questions here, and and I too have this situation when I sleep at night. Sometimes my feet feel like they're kind of balling up on themselves, if you will. And um, 
Is it a good idea to wear some sort of brace at night to try and get push flat? Yeah, you know, if you've lost range of motion and you're not maintaining it throughout the day and doing an exercise routine throughout the day and you're just losing range, then sure. I'm um, wearing a night brace. Some people love the concept of wearing a night brace because it can help stretch things out. You know, a lot, a lot of, um, let's say, normal individuals need to wear night bracing from plantar fasciitis. You know, because that calf muscle is so strong, it's pulling on the foot as you sleep at night. And then when you take your first couple steps in the morning, you end up dorsiflexing the foot and you end up stretching all of the small muscles on the bottom of your foot. And that's painful. And so a lot of people with CMT get that bottom of their foot quite tender and can have plantar fasciitis. And it, it can become, you know, uh, like almost like a self perpetuating problem where you just sleep at night, you relax, your feet are pointing down, you take the first couple of steps when you get up in the morning and you tear all the little muscles on the bottom of your feet because the Achilles tendon is so strong, like a tug of war around the heel bone. The big guy is always going to win on that tug of war. So we do build night bracing for people that can hold their foot at 90 degrees. It all depends on your foot positioning. If your foot can be in a normal position all on its own, then you, you could probably get away with using a prefabricated type of night splint for plantar fasciitis. Um, but if your foot can't get into a neutral position and it's somewhat torqued like some of these pictures I'm showing you, then you need to have a custom brace made that has the straps like what I showed you on Ethan's brace and that straightens out the heel. So you're really stretching your Achilles tendon at the proper joint and at the proper location. And you're not then going to be stretching things that you don't want to have stretched. So um, getting back to the foot orthotic, so if, if Bob, you can interject if I didn't answer that enough, but uh, I want to talk about this foot orthotic. So there's that yeah, posting. No, that was great. Thank you. Good. Um, here's the posting we talk about. Um, so there it is with the foot. So we want lateral posting, lateral support. So these you know, this is a, a young individual, very athletic, came into me with these foot orthotics made from his podiatrist, you know, which it drives me up the wall that you see these inserts that have a huge amount of arch support, you know, and it's like, well, what's that arch support doing? It's driving the foot this way. So, you know, and now you can see this foot is all torqued and everything, and it's just a very inefficient way of walking. So, you know, I built him some inserts, and this is just a very good comparison. So there's that same foot, but it's much straighter. So he just felt so much more balance, so much more efficiency, because, boy, this guy was biking across the country. Um, so uh, um, it, it was very powerful watching the difference between the two. So that's what you want on your foot orthotics. You definitely, you, know, you definitely need to have support all along the outside with very little arch support because you already have too much arch support. Um, we talked a little bit about SMOs. So these are the SMOs. So we can, these arrows are just pointing on the forces that we can apply to the body. So if this forefoot is pulling inwards too much, well, we use the plastic here to sort of help push out. And what's fun about this plastic, it's actually a very flexible plastic. So it's not as rigid as you think, um, just looking at it. So you now this is a huge wing that comes across the top of the foot, but this thing can open way up, which is, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty neat how it operates. So all at times, if someone needs more support, they'll wear one of these inside uh, a carbon prefabricated AFO. So you can mix and match a lot. So what's also neat about this, and uh, getting back to someone's question about, you know, my muscles fatiguing, wearing, you know, having a, a system, like an add-on system, if this is harnessed within a taller AFO, then at times you could remove the superstructure and just use this. Or the same is true with the foot orthotic. If the foot orthotic is with a carbon AFO, maybe at times you want to just use the foot orthosis and not 
the whole uh, prefabricated uh, AFL. So here's a situation that I just talked about. There's that custom insert inside, and this is um, married along with an Allard AFL. Here's the exact situation for a younger child who was very flaccid on plantar flexors and dorsiflexors. So she needed much more control. So she has an FMO here and combined with a kitty light type of um, Allard prefabricated system. I love the colors here. It's almost hard to see what I'm pointing at. So what's uh, great about these is not only do they help lift up the foot during swing phase, but they at heel strike, when my arrow is here, it slowly brings that foot down, and slowly brings the knee forward into this position. But then what's nice about it is now we're at mid stance here, and then we go towards toe off. Um, towards toe off, the front of these braces start flexing and can give strength right here and it can just help with push off and pushing yourself forward. So that's why we like a lot of these carbon systems because they're flexible. They allow the body to flow and to move. They're also very lightweight. Um, this is a, a combination here of systems that uh, you know, I've created that uh, you know, this one has a hinged brace that we're really not doing anything to control this leg but we're controlling things side to side. Um, but on this side, this gentleman asked for, you know, like almost one good leg to stand on. So he needed a little bit more support. So I did build him a stronger brace that he could actually, uh, um, you know, he, he was a teacher and he needed to be to stand at a podium and just be solid on his feet. So he wore this during his presentation. And uh, that offered him the stability that he was after. So it's, again, being very specific about what the needs are for the individual. Energy storing systems. So each of these systems all have their own positives and negatives. And uh, um, these are both custom made. This is known on the market as the fat brace. Um, these are great. You know, they're great uh, because they are fairly strong, but they're also quite dynamic. So you do get a lot of motion with wearing these. Um, you know, and typically I would be putting someone who is either A, uh, very weak and need a little bit more standing stability, or B, someone that's very athletic and is going to put a lot of their body weight through their AFOs that are going to torque a lot and spring back. So what's amazing about these is what may work one way for one individual on one hand, well, foot per se, um, that same device could be just designed a little bit differently and work for, you know, a super athlete. Um, so you want A for stability on one hand and maybe for an athlete on the other. So it's all about how you design it and build it, which is critical. Um, typically, I, I would like to see some um, foot control that needs to be built afterwards. And your orthodist very likely needs to do that independent of the manufacturer of these devices. Uh, he's very specific, the manufacturer of the fat brace, on what his design is. And you've just got to accept the fact that um, when we as orthotists are sending a device to be made um, by uh, this company, he's got a system that he follows. So that system, more often than not, doesn't work well for a CMT foot. And we need to modify the device to actually get it to work well for a CNC foot. So many times I'll actually wrap a, a custom foot orthotic um, before I'm fabricating this. And I'll tell them that I've actually made an insert, I've neutralized the foot, and that insert will lay in the bottom of this. So these are just some other custom uh, carbon designs, a little bit smaller, nice and flexible. Uh, probably a little bit less control here as well. but. Uh, so it's fun about doing things for individuals. So if you look at all these, yeah, yeah. Can I just jump in for a second? If we can go back one slide. Um, we asked a question about something they had read about for the military that had, uh, I guess they had devised these for soldiers called Odeo. I'm just curious if you've yeah. heard of it. 
Yep, I have heard of it, and um, you know the the IDO, is that what you said, the ODIO. They're they're very strong, very um, um, I guess springy, and so in the case of uh, uh, maybe some nerve damage from the uh, veterans, and that's where it was originally built. You know, you've got some pretty strong individuals who want to get a lot of energy return out of the device. You know, I. Uh, this could very well work with a number of individuals with CNT, but again, um, you don't want to overbrace an individual. So you don't want to be putting one of these very rigid, strong carbon devices on someone if you can't get any flex out of it. If you don't get any flex out of it, then it truly is now a rigid device. So that's what's tricky about uh, some of the terminology that might be used, you know. You know, someone might say, well, I've been told that these carbon devices aren't rigid and that they're dynamic. Well, that's true if it's built that way. But if it's so strong, so much carbon laid up, and it doesn't move, well, it's now rigid. And, you know, that's what's really, really challenging about any of these custom carbon devices is it's that layup that is so critical. Um, I personally have long given up trying to do this in my own lab, and we tried for a long time. We had so many devices break. These guys who are, um, you know, we as orthotists order and from them, is you know they build probably a hundred, two hundred. I don't even know how many, um, but a huge volume every day, and they've really figured out through a lot of failures. Um, how to lay this stuff up and how to get the dynamic action model based on weight and activity level. And that's why you see a lot of labs sending them to these companies to have them fabricate it. So uh, that's what's neat about them. Um, one, more, one more question along the lines of the braces and the types. Yeah. Is there anything that like a first step person could buy in the local pharmacy? Or would you say you know, stay away from that? Well, I, I think ph pharmacies are going to carry, um, and f so let's say pharmacies and like big sporting goods, sporting stores, they're going to carry some very simple stuff that is probably from ankle sprains. Um, so these multi-ligamentous types of devices, um, they are going to help with mild cases. It'll help with sprains. You know, um, I would... I would caution about relying on that too much without seeing an orthotist because if you're prone to sprains and they're very likely as a muscle imbalance, then you very likely should have a foot or so she's under your foot to prevent you from getting tight and losing range of motion over time. So those, those are the, the really the critical things I think is up. You know, it's again being aware of your range of motion and um, having good alignment. Now, I have seen some very simple, um, uh, these elastic devices that uh, can go around your calf and sort of reach down and, and connect to your shoe. You know, they, they help with swing phase, but they really don't help with foot slap, so that's that foot heel strike and foot slap. And then they become completely counterproductive at push off. So if I go back, let me go back and really get lost here. That's what's really counterproductive about this device um, is that it is set in a lot of dorsiflexion. So you know you have to use your plantar flexors um, to push yourself forward. So the first part of you using your plantar flexors has to be enough strength to get this straight or at least to 90 degrees, and then enough strength to push yourself forward. So, th so this is, I don't, I don't know if that made any sense at all, Bob, but uh, you know, these devices that just dorsiflex the foot, they work against you when you're trying to propel yourself forward. All right, I think this is where I was. So, you know, just some good slides. You know, I know we've got 15 minutes, and I don't want to Oh, I love these questions that you're asking, Bob, because it's at least addressing people uh, right away, and I like that. Uh, but these are just showing some devices. How does this harness on the inside? Look at how straight we have that foot. 
you know, both both for feet were the same. So there's the comparison of what we can do. So can you just imagine how much more efficient you are walking? Yes, it's a pain in the rear end that you have to wear a device like this, but you know, you're much more efficient. You can go out and do the stuff that you want to do. You know, most of the time, you know, shoes, that's always a good question, but uh, New Balance shoes are a great sneaker. Brooks, you can get these in some really extra wide sneakers. Um, I like uh, Keen, Merrill, Clarks. Uh, there's a company called Unstructured. I think more often than not, um, you, you're better to get like a more of a European styled shoe because they're a little bit bigger, you know, than than some of the American style. Uh, for the most part, it's you know, ladies are going to be a little bit more concerned with their footwear and such. And uh, but in Europe, there's, there's typically a little bit more space with their footwear choices. So these are some good examples here of the straps just pulling this foot straight. And then you can see a little a little bit of padding here holding that um, the forefoot from being adducted. So this is a counter force right here. Does a nice job of straightening this uh, foot out. So we already went through this. Do orthoses make CMT worse? Can I say no? You know, um, you know, I'm someone who wears uh, two carbon AFOs on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I do that so I can be very busy and active throughout my day, my work day. And when I get home at night, you know, many times I'll put on my silicone AFOs, and uh, you know, sometimes I'm too tired to even wear those silicone AFOs, but. Uh, I know that my body's working, so I like to wear those on the weekends. You know, sometimes I don't do it because I don't walk as well, and I want to be able to do more. So for me, it's a balance. But I, I sort of think of, I think of the long term. I think that I always do want to work myself, want to work my body, and uh, you know, even though I, I have AFOs and I wear AFOs, um, I don't perceive that these AFOs in any way are making me weaker. I think that they're actually keeping me going and keeping me stronger, um, but maybe it's how I'm using them as well. Hey David, could you uh, go back yeah. a couple slides real quick to the uh, the carbon? Uh, you know, yeah, right there. Uh, someone's asking: uh, Are the ones are the braces on the right there, or on the left also? Are these custom, or are they manufactured? And, and is there a name for the manufacturer? These, these are both custom devices. So this one is the name brand, um, the fat brace, and this one is a complete custom carbon uh, AFO. So there's a, a lot of labs that specialize but don't actually see patients, and they just specialize as a laboratory. And, um, you know, so these ones are purely custom. There's no name brand to these. So my FOs are flat on the bottom, and I wear orthotics, and the shoe insole is on top of the AFO. So basically what they're describing is there's a foot orthotic like that on top of a prefabricated AFO like this. Uh, I am wondering if the AFO should have the orthotic arch support built into it, or is it common to wear orthotics with the AFO? I like the concept. So whenever you have a prefabricated AFO, it is going to be generic. So you can see how this is a very flat foot plate. There's nothing specific about you with it. Um, the positive features with this device is how this interacts with the, at, with the ground at heel strike here, with how this starts to move forward at mid stance to toe off. That this is a superstructure. So you think about putting a foot orthosis like this on top of this, and that's what I like to do. And it lends itself, you know, at night for you just to be wearing something like this and to pop this in this uh, device out. So I that I like that concept. So now if the device is all custom made, um, as I mentioned previously, I sometimes will still put in these kind of inserts because these are very easy to pull out and make adjustments to, and then it can slip into the superstructure. 
So sometimes we'll make these so they're physically connected to the device, and sometimes we'll make them so they're removable. How often should AFOs be replaced? I think these are some neat questions. And, um, you know, this is where I, all of these sort of um, work in harmony with one another. And uh, typically insurances do follow Medicare, um, and policy states that a device should last five years. So, you know, how do you get those multiple devices? Um, you know, I, I, I think that the key for me as a practitioner and talking to a patient that if something needy isn't meeting your needs, I will happily go to battle with any insurance carrier and explain and write letters as to why a new device is needed. And invariably we get them covered. Sometimes it's denied the first time and then you ask the second time. Sometimes it's denied that second time and you ask again. Um, the key here is that CMT is progressive. So it's a ludicrous policy for Medicare to have this, but you have to imagine that this is a policy meant for the masses. It really doesn't apply to CMT because by the nature of CMT, it is progressive. So if you find after a year or two that your device just isn't working for you, if you're fatigued, be your own advocate. Get into your orthotist. You know, you, you might find that these prefabricated devices, they, they never last five years or rarely. Um, Medicare's policy is really more for custom devices. And if you have a prefabricated device, well, it, it is likely going to fail before five years. And, um, you know, Allard has a good policy and they will replace it if it's failed within a year for free. Um, so um, these prefabricated devices, if they've broken, well, the next phase of the Medicare policy, if something is irreparable, well, that can be replaced. So um, don't let yourselves not have something for fear that, uh, you know, you're going to be financially responsible for it because it's really not normally the case. You know, obviously deductibles in private insurances, you know, you can't ignore those, but Medicare covers 80% of the price of a device. And, you know, sometimes that 20% can be a huge burden. But, uh, you know, I, I think if you can talk to your orthotist, maybe you can spread payments over a longer period of time. Um, I, I think most of the, the people that I communicate with, that that's sort of a pretty normal occurrence if someone has any kind of financial hardship, is to try to spread payments over a longer period of time so you can actually have something to get yourself doing the stuff that you want to do. And, you know, this also applies to, uh, to new straps, new padding. Your device needs to be comfortable for you to wear it, so you should maintain it. You know, the same way that you try to maintain your automobile. You know, so um, I think that very likely your orthotist is going to be much more willing than your auto repair man to extend payments out over a long period of time. So um, don't be afraid to ask. Hey David, I have a question for you. Yep. Um, someone had a, um, like myself, I had ankle fusion uh, now 35 years ago, 40 years ago, close to. Um, and um, this person had it, but the uh, the fusion in one of their ankles did not take. Um, is there, do you know of any, have you seen any patients, I should say, that um, come to you with like a failed surgery or a failed fusion? And is there any, are there any bracing options at that point? Yeah, it depends on, um, you know, the first question is, is, are you in a lot of pain or, or is it instability? You know, if it's instability, then we try to stabilize and then give as much motion as possible. But if it's pain and there's arthritis in there, um, then we really do try to lock up a particular joint. You know, um, very likely the fusion is going to be something like a triple orthodesis where the side-to-side -side motion is the one that hasn't taken. Um, it's pretty rare for an orthopedist to fuse a foot so it doesn't move up and down. Um, but if it if the foot doesn't move up and down, then since it doesn't move up and down, then it's fine for me to build a rigid brace around that foot and ankle to try to take away stress and strain at that joint. 
because you're not going to weaken the muscles because the foot doesn't move up and down. And so you can stabilize it. But that's, so that's what we try to do with osteoarthritis or any kind of pain at a joint, is we try to minimize motion at that joint. We try to get the superstructure to take away um, some of the torque. So yes, I do see uh, things failing. So I, I know I want to uh, try to stick to our timeline here. We've got three minutes. Are there some other questions that you have? Or are there, um, do you want me to just keep going through here? Well, there's a, there's a couple of things I think would be interesting to address and that haven't come up yet. Um, what, what is best for hammer toes? Um, is there anything you can do from the bracing side to protect hammer toes from rubbing on a shoe, that sort of thing? Yeah, you know, I think that um, what I try to do with hammer toes with CMT is just to, um, A, have a soft insert beneath the toe because, you know, with, it's, it's more likely a claw toe. We call them hammer toes, but it's more, in CMT, it's more of a claw toe where you're getting flexion at the distal and the proximal joint. So. Um, that's called a claw toe. And so with a claw toe, you're going to have the nail sort of digging straight down into, you know, the, the bottom of a shoe. And so I would typically put a soft padding into the AFO to help with that cushion. Now, the flip side negative to that, and I always try to revert back to that scale of things, is for me to put something soft and cushiony inside your shoe, the only way to have it soft and cushiony is to have some thickness to it. Otherwise, it's not soft and cushiony. So when you have something like that going inside the shoe, that's where you need an extra depth shoe. And that's where we come back to, uh, um, you know, the slide I have up here, like New Balance and Keen, you just need a deeper toe box. Uh, you know, we can buy uh, um, extra depth shoes for individuals if the traditional shoes don't work. Um, there's many shoe stores that are local around the country that specialize in these special shoes. Uh, PW Minor makes some shoes that have multiple layers of uh, insoles. You know, Aphex is another great company that has really deep shoes. Um, some of these shoes might be labeled for diabetics because uh, you know, a lot of times diabetics will have neuropathy and have a foot that is going to be quite swollen with some claw toes as well. Now, they have vascular issues, um, completely separate from us, but their foot structure looks somewhat similar. And if you can find a shoe that maybe for a diabetic it's going to be a little bit deeper. So there could be some choices there as well. Did I, did I answer everything? <laughs> yep, I think uh, I think that's good. We're just about you know out of time here. I want to ask you uh, a couple of quick questions um, about just seeing an orthotist. Um, this question has come in, do does everyone need a referral to see you from their medical doctor? You do, yes. Um, you have to have a prescription. You know, it's, uh, you know, I think even as much as HIPAA has regulated things that we need to, there needs to be a reason for us to really consult with you. Um, so we do need to have a prescription. It can be a generic prescription. Um, so as I said before, everything follows Medicare guidelines. Well, Medicare's rules are quite strict and stringent, and so we need that prescription. We then, once we've seen you, we write back to the doctor, just letting them know what uh, our plan is, and then from that plan, we get a detailed written order. Um, what we also need to do, so it's it's good for you, for everyone to know a lot of the behind-the-scenes work that needs to be done to get these braces because, you know, many times we think of the brace as just, wow, that's an expensive device. Um, but there's a lot that happens behind the scenes that you might not see to actually custom make a device or for a manufacturer to build a device and then resell it to us. 
that and then turn we have to customize it to you but there's also a lot of the paperwork that's behind the scenes so in the case of Medicare and many of these insurances even though we are the ones who know precisely what to do for the brace it has to be in the doctor's medical notes so we have to inform the doctor typically by a letter about exactly what we will be doing to your brace and they can't just sign that letter and send it back to us. They have to dictate that into their notes and send us a copy of their notes indicating that they're actually telling us what to do to make your device suitable for you. It's a bit of a crazy system, but it's where we're at today. So uh, thank you for that. Finally, the last question uh, that we'll take this evening and uh, how does somebody who has CMT find a qualified orthotist to work with? I'm sure everybody would love to see you uh, up in up in New York, <laughs> yeah. but uh, um, well, you know, knowing that's not possible, so what do we do? Well, there's um, the CMTA is doing, I think, a great job in getting the centers of excellences um, up and running. So those are are sprinkled throughout the country. And so, you know, I think that, I think part of our responsibility as individuals with CMT who we want to get it, we really should be doing everything we can to educate the doctors, getting the information into the center of excellences, getting, getting the patient knowledge base to the centers. And um, at these centers, there are orthotists who are aware and knowledgeable and are keen on learning um, about um, that's effective, etc. And uh, you know, we fortunately um, this year got connected with a whole series of other orthotists from the Center of Excellence, and we're trying to collaborate and compile all of this information and um, disseminate it to them. Um, I, you know, I, there's going to be a lot of people who can't get to the centers, and so what do they do? I think what they do is they listen to webinars like this, they uh, go to the CMT Association website and um, gather some information and, you know, you become an advocate for yourself. Um, you know, I know that you can always send in questions to the CMTA and um, questions come to me routinely throughout the month and that uh, I'm happy to answer. And Sean McHale is another uh, advisory board member. He too has a lot of questions that are answered. Um, I, I guess you th those are your those are your options today. All right. Well. Um, with that, everybody, I think we're going to have to wrap it up for this evening. We did not get to all the questions. Uh, we'll keep a note here, and uh, I'll let David know what the other questions were. Maybe he can answer some directly, or we can uh, schedule another future webinar for this. Uh, thank you so much, David, for joining us this evening, and I'll give you the last word here, and, uh, and I'll say goodbye now. So, David, if you have anything else to say. Yeah, well, thank you very much. I hope this is for everybody and as Bob said if there are some questions that you, you would like to send my way I'll do the best job I can to, to try to answer them and uh, my best to all thank you